don't believe in time. Time doesn't exist. Can you please contradict me? <laughs> well, of course, I'm a philosopher. I can always <laughs> contradict people. But actually, that's not. So I guess a few years ago, the very natural response would be, well, that's a mad view. Like, what what have you, like, what, which toads have you been licking would be, I would have think, been a reasonable response to someone who said, look, I don't think there's any time. And it's, I guess it's obvious why that would have been the response because it's certainly, except for you, the most of us, it seems very obvious at this time. So it seems very obvious to the rest of us that uh, there's some kind of dimension that we kind of extended along and that we, we live our lives through this temporal dimension and that we, you know, remember the way things were and we think about the way things will be. And it's kind of, in some ways, it feels like it's sort of essential to us being the kinds of things we are, that we have this sense of our of our whole lives, that we're not just this creatures trapped in this one moment. And so I would have said that to you. Um, but. <laughs> but me and some collaborators are, are just working on the tail end of a book which is actually exploring this whole issue about whether there's time. And to be clear, we don't argue that there isn't. We're, we're not quite that, uh, that controversial. But what we do want to do is make it seem less of a silly question to ask. So that's really the goal of the book is to suggest that it makes sense to ask and that the answer could be that there might be no time, which is not quite as gung-ho as your there is no time. Like that, that would be a startling book to write. But <laughs> but that's that's what we're um that's what we're aiming to do in that book is to make it seem to people who just think it's obvious that there's time that there are interesting questions here to ponder. What's the argument for time? Time to me is like a matter of perception and also what reality is is only the present moment because whatever happened it is no more and whatever has to happen, it doesn't exist yet. Very nicely articulated. <laughs> That's a, a potent view in philosophy, which philosophers call presentism, which is exactly that view that there's really only this present moment. Past things did exist, but they don't anymore, and future things will exist, but they don't yet, which is not quite as poetic as you put it, <laughs> um, but it's exactly that that thought. And that captures nicely the idea that there isn't a dimension, so it's not like, you know, you can think of three spatial dimensions and things extended along them, and that view precisely is the view that there's not this kind of fourth temporal dimension. There's literally just this moment, and it kind of changes as new stuff happens. It's interesting that you're thinking of that as a view on which there's no time. I think many people who have that view think of that as a view in which there is time, but it's just, it's not a dimension in the way that space is. People who are motivated by that view think that something wrong happened when <laughs> Einstein came along, that, you know, he was a smart chap and all, but they think that his way of conceiving of the world is this kind of four-dimensional manifold where time is just another fourth dimension, albeit it's not, it's not the same as the spatial dimensions, but it's kind of similar in various ways, right? They think this was a big mistake and that we shouldn't think of time like that. So they're kind of thinking, they're, they're totally with you that there just is this moment and it's just changing as new things happen. But they, I guess they are thinking that's what time is. Time is sort of the changing of this moment now now um, and that's a kind of substantive sense of temporal passage what would be a better way to describe it if it's not like a spatial dimension on this kind of presentist view yes yeah it, that's that's a good question when i try and teach it to sort of undergraduates i say look imagine you're kind of taking a god's eye perspective and you're looking down on the entire universe and you just see a literally a kind of three-dimensional slice of reality which is just the three spatial dimensions and no no temporal extent at all but what you see when you're looking down is that that little slice of reality is constantly changing and what you're seeing there is kind of the universe in flux, this kind of dynamical change. And what you're seeing just is time passing. That's all there is to time passing on that view. But you might say, look, um, I like that view, but I don't want to call that time. And I don't want to think that it's time's not passing. So you, you could have a version of that view that says, look, everything you've said is right, except you've kind of mislabeled things. So what we really should say is there isn't any time on that view. What there is is just this three dimensions and they change so that things are different now than they were and things will be different later than they are now. But there's no sense that in, this, in which there's really time and there's no sense in which time really passes. You've said all there is to say when you say that there's just the now and that the now changes. Think about how the way people think about time kind of connects to other aspects of their lives. So how it connects with deliberation and planning and those kinds of things. So a lot of the preferences that we have and the kind of deliberations are clearly kind of cross-temporal because it's great to decide to do something, but it's going to be your later self that actually is the poor chap that has to do it. And the decisions you make now kind of ramify down the track. So it's your future self that either gets the benefits or the disbenefits, depending on what kinds of things you do. But is my future self me? Well, it depends what you mean by are they me? So of course, different philosophers take different views about this as well. 
Because one might argue the same point, like I'm me only now and yeah. I'm now not the same me that I was right. just a moment ago. Yes, so that in fact would be my preferred <laughs> view of the matter. Um, but there is a, a kind of stark divide in, well stark, there's a divide in philosophy between people who think that your future self really is you, albeit they're going to be different in various ways, obviously. But they are kind of imagining you as existing at multiple points in time and it's the very same person, albeit that that person was a baby and consequently very different <laughs> to the current version. But in some sense, the the thought is that it's the very same entity kind of moving through time or being or existing at different times so that that's kind of one view i haven't done any empirical research on this but my guess is that if we ask people on the street well we wouldn't want to ask them like that but if we if we did this a bit more carefully my guess is that people probably think that that's probably the notion that people are generally speaking going with which is that their future self is them in some fairly straightforward sense i guess it depends on how you define consciousness as well oh, maybe <laughs> i don't know if, i don't know if it depends on that but i definitely think there's an open there, there's other ways of thinking about what the relationship is between your future self and your current self which doesn't require that it's the very same thing so other other views have it that there's kind of a, a sequence of selves and they're all different so there's the you now and there's the you that was and there's the you that will be and sure, they're connected in important and interesting ways. So there's kind of causal connections between them, which mean that like if you go out now and get a massive tattoo on your head, that your future self will, will have that tattoo unless they go through some kind of complicated shenanigans to remove it. In a way that that's not true. Like if you get a tattoo on your head, your next door neighbour is fine. They are not going to wake up the next morning and find a tattoo on their head unless you've broken in. And <laughs> so there's this kind of interesting and important causal connections between the selves that are in some sense part of the same persisting person versus those that are part of distinct people. But nevertheless, on this view, they are distinct selves. So there's kind of a, a sequence of different selves. And you could think of a person as a kind of loose coalition of these selves. So the selves are connected. They kind of depend on one another because if you want to do something, it's going to be some self down the line that actually has to do it. You depend on them because your projects are things that they have to finish, but they depend on you because they'll be paupers if you don't put money aside and, you know, do the right kinds of things. So that's a, a quite different way of thinking about selves as a kind of, as like a group, but a kind of diachronic group where the, the members of the group are kind of exist at different times. And that's a, a view that I'm more happy with. Think about how, what the connections are between the way people think about time and the way they imagine the universe is kind of temporally and the way they go about kind of deliberating about their own lives and what they're going to do in the future and how they're, preferences should be about where in times they want certain kinds of things to happen. 